The Wheel of Time, Season 2, Episodes 1 through 3, full spoiler discussion, is what I'm going to be bringing you here today, and I am excited to do so. But first, if you just want a totally spoiler-free first impressions of Episodes 1 through 3, I think it's a step up from Season 1 after you get past the first episode by a bit. It's not the highest bar to clear, but Season 2 has certainly done done that, especially if you turn off the part of your brain that expects this to be an adaptation of Robert Jordan's work and instead view it more as a new story inspired by Robert Jordan's works of The Wheel of Time. I'll give a full rating at the end, but for now, let's go ahead and dive into Season 2, Episode 1, in my opinion, the only episode so far that's as weak as Season 1. My biggest issue with Season 2, Episode 1 is how much we just did not get The Great Hunt's opening. The Great Hunt is not only one of my favorite Wheel of Time books, but in my personal opinion, it has one of the strongest openings of the full series. Getting into vague spoilers, it involves drama between our young adult crew as the pressure of the wider world is building on them, and they're not handling it very well and taking out on each other in some ways. You really start to feel the circumstance they're under drive them apart. On top of that, we have a nightmare sequence involving Pot on Fane that still, at this late point in my life, if I reread it, gives me chills. And as the world continues to grow, especially around Rand, it feels like it is closing in on him. That kicks off a book that is filled with heists, chases, and truly feels different from the Lord of the Rings roots Eye of the World was so heavily steeped in. Intelligently, also, our party is not as split as it is currently in the show, which allows the narrative to be more digestible as the narrative is growing. One of the strongest elements to The Great Hunt as a whole is how much it keeps the reader rooted in the world while explaining so many of the broader concepts that come into play so importantly later on. Season 2, Episode 1, for me was really hard to swallow because basically we get none of that. Even the opening between Rand and Lan, which I knew half how Season 1 ended you weren't going to get, that iconic theme setting uh, scene for The Great Hunt is just completely gone. There's not even an attempt to recreate it, and that is frustrating for me. Seeing something that has been regarded as long as I've been discussing Wheel of Time in this community as a fan favorite scene completely cut for reasons that I just can't fully wrap my head around, yeah, bothers me. And if you're a Wheel of Time fan who can just let that go, good for you. Like, I have no issue with that. I think that's wonderful. You're going to enjoy this show probably a bit more overall than me. I just am very attached to the story Robert Jordan told, and it feels like I'm having something important to the story taken away from me in exchange for the slowest episode maybe of the entire show yet. There are still, though, strong moments in this episode that showed me those roots from season one that are growing into uh, more substantial pieces of this show to enjoy. I mean, there's even just a one-word spoken line from Rain, Door, that spoke volumes between the relationship and how it currently sits between Lan and Moraine. Though, there's this conflict brewing between the two that feels so artificial and like a massive betrayal to the core relationship between Lan and Moraine we get in the books where, yes, they have tension with each other, but it never descends into this just poorly communicated almost childish feeling, what are you hiding from me, that I am just not enjoying from beginning to end of the whole three episodes. But let's get into what actually does kick off this episode instead of the scene between Land and Rand we get in the book. And that would be a forsaken meeting with dark friends in a room where we see Fane is present as well. And the tension there was actually pretty good. I like watching one of the forsaken take this child up to a trollic and like, getting used to being around one of these monsters. I think we also got a somewhat interesting look into an interpretation of what this Forsaken's ideology is communicated to us, the viewer. And if you flip off expecting it to be communicated in 
any semblance to the way it's been communicated within the story, you can see how this is working the best with what season one left them with to try and recreate it for season two. Once we get to the White Tower in hindsight, some of the best elements for episodes two and three are pretty well set up here. Uh, one, the tour of the tower we get kind of following on through it was quite enjoyable. And I really like the level of detail that's being crafted into the tower sets, though they do feel so similar in various halls that I'm having a hard time feeling a wider scope of the whole structure. It's still better than I expected it to be. And the whole academic vibe that's going on within the tower is actually better executed than where my expectations were set. Because as I've been saying since the end of season one, having an actual focus on learning the power, showing the intricacies and the details uh, of what you know channeling can do is where this show has an advantage over so many other epic fantasy shows that are on TV right now. And season two seems aware of that and does give us moments to see not only the full display of diverse powers that can be brought through channeling the one power, uh, but how difficult it can be to learn. And that segues nicely into talking about Nynaeve, who is, in terms of performance and writing, both the star of these first three episodes, but not due to the actual dialogue, just what's done in the actual story, some of the biggest issues as well. We'll get more into that with episode three, though. The training within the kitchen scrubbing scene, I thought was quite nice. I don't understand understand exactly why an Aes Sedai would bust in on some novices, I think just doing dishes and decide now is a good time to teach them something. Maybe they were gathering in the kitchen for this lesson. It just felt a little bit weird. And I didn't even notice that till Kayla turned to me and went, why are they going from cleaning to learning? And I was like, I... I'm not sure. <laughs> the most positive thing I can say about episode one of season two is it seems to be leaning in heavily to trying to fill in the gaps left from season one, even adding in colors to the various weaves. It just feels like a better understanding while there's still some information that seems contradictory to the books in terms of just giving us as much importance, as much depth as we the readers know can be brought to the screen. The elephant in the room though is they've just kind of retconned the ending with Nynaeve basically dying or almost dying and being brought back to life. They're just not addressing that. It's, it's just we're moving on from there. Don't think about it. Hey, this novice took someone whose eyes were like burnt out from their skull and unconscious for hours and healed them. Should we all discuss that at all? No, no, we're, we're just going to make a threesome joke at the same young woman. Cool. From there, though, I want to jump over to talking about what's happening with Perrin, which turns into one of the most interesting threads in these first three episodes. But again, in its start, just feels so jarring. He is just out chasing down Padon Fane, and we don't get any of that setup, any of that real good grounding as a viewer or a reader getting into this chase starting. And instead, it's just kind of like a boot in the ass out the door of just, you're going on this chase now. And the characterization of the people around Perrin, I'm not that big a fan of. I recognize like Uno and the other Shinarans. They're, they're really cool to see. But aside from the action sequences with them, which were pretty enjoyable, I like that the Shinarans are not being played down. These are some badass dudes. All of the characterization happening, especially with Elias, who, yes, is being folded in with Huron, as we all kind of suspected he would be, or I think we even confirmed that earlier on. It's not giving me the nuance that was prevalent there that even built a sense of paranoia among this party, though I see seeds for a twist coming that I'm not going to spoil yet uh, for the books that's there in the second book coming. Uh, I just don't want to fully talk about that unless it's confirmed. I don't want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't read the book. But the representation of Perrin's wolf powers, of all the choices that could be made, uh, personally just a least favorite for me. These visions and the way Elias is being characterized feel so wrong to me. And the showing up of wolves and Perrin like running off with just, uh, I I'm not feeling that at all yet. And this chase kind of hits this big stop where we haven't even felt any real momentum of them pursuing the people with the horn when they come across these bodies and decide to bury them all. And the whole execution of this just rang hollow for me. Yes, I saw the seeds being planted, uh, but it did feel like it just hadn't been earned yet. It felt like something that should have been happening in an episode two, which I'm going to come full circle here with this episode with getting back into Lan and Moraine, where it feels like they're almost becoming childish and petty with each other, especially with Lan being like, make dinner yourself 
And then there's this end combat with some fades, which would have been so much more enjoyable if we got Thrakar at this moment, but I don't even know if we're gonna get those in the show at this point. And then Lan just being like, what are you hiding from me? And the soft nuances of the relationship between Lan and Moraine from the book are just done away with for something that feels uh, completely different here. And it's the only thread that, in my opinion, didn't even get better as these episodes went on where other relationships and plot lines did improve. Uh, they just didn't really seem to hear at all. And having Moraine successfully land a stab on a fade Let's just move on. Let's just move on to episode two. And this time we're gonna start talking about Rand, who we don't see until really the end of episode one, and then he folds in quite heavily for episode two. And at first, I was very against with whatever Rand was doing because it felt just so out of place. But if they are just going to be folding in things from later books and trying to put in characterization for stuff way down the road for Rand, because uh, they know they might not have time to fully flesh it out in later seasons, I can actually more so than almost any other plot line uh, understand why the changes for Rand are being made here, especially because surrounding him as he seems to be working in an asylum for people who have lost their minds, suffering from PTSD, uh, it, it that is a relationship we're going to need to see Rand have quite a bit of experience with because obviously he's going to be steeping into those uh, angles quite heavily here. So I at first was very like, whoa, no, especially having him just jump a guy and beat the ever-living piss out of him at one point, which felt kind of like a left turn. But when the madness gets folded in and the Celine angle, which I'm not going to spoil for down the road here, uh, all comes together. By the end of episode two, I actually was going, this is not Rand from book two, but this is at least if you're turning off that wheel of time switch a cool story that I'm curious about. And the dynamic between him and Celine feels, while well, its setup is entirely different, uh, pitch perfect for the type of tendrils of manipulations and pushings that are happening here uh, to be feel just fully, yes, this is someone who is so tempting to get closer and closer to, open up to. I really like seeing all that's happening with Rand uh, leaning into a trajectory that feels dangerous, that feels unpredictable, and that is early book Rand. Early book Rand, like, decapitates people who come across him and then, like, just doesn't address it again because he's, like, just pressing so much down as madness bubbles up in him. And especially if this season is going to try and realize that madness, this feels like a strong setup for that realization. And the reveal that the reason he's here, the reason he's trying to work here is apparently low gain after he was gentled uh, was sent here. Strange, uh, I don't know why low gain was sent here, but okay, because it allowed us some of the best performance scenes of Rand working alongside Logan, but we'll get more to that in a moment. Also, just small note, Rand giving a little kid some money, small detail, I really like that. Rand comes from the bottom and works his way up, but never forgets where he came from and is always in his day-to-day -day life looking out for the most downtrodden person, no matter how mentally unstable he gets. So that, just those little details, they give me tendrils of faith for what is to come down the road. Now, with Perrin, instead of being with Matt and Rand in this hunting party on his own, of course, there's certain scenes that were important for Rand for specific reasons that are instead put on Perrin's shoulders. And it feels just like a complete misunderstanding of why those scenes were important in their context. And the scene is just now being put in here because from a writing standpoint, it's like, well, the flies scene is really iconic. So we're gonna just insert it and totally change the context around it and implication. And so yes, Perrin comes across the flies and gets like a vision, which again is not how his wolf powers have ever come across from me, uh, but it's there. And it's kind of weak. Until episode three, Perrin's entire storyline just feels really not cohesive with the rest of it and just like random sequences of things happening inserted into the episodes. Cohesion is a problem that feels like it could have been avoided if they hadn't set themselves up in a way to have everyone so separated, even more so than they are in the book. Which brings us to Matt who, yes, in the book, is with Perrin. And here, he is, this is the most understandable issue because of the actor leaving and how they had to make up for this, uh, in the White Tower, played by a new actor, who I am very happy to say 
is doing not just Barney's interpretation of Matt, but something that feels like Donald Flynn's interpretation of Matt, and is just as strong of a Matt while feeling distinctly different. And while I think it would have felt more wrong as an earlier example of Matt, I think Donald Flynn has a lot more potential to realize later season Matt, because uh, he has a little bit more of a uh, less raggedy appeal to his overall look. And Donald Flynn, it, once we get into like noble reject Matt, I think will actually fit better than Barney's. That doesn't mean he's a better Matt overall. It's just two actors playing a character. And I think Barney was really good at early Matt. And I think Donald is good enough now to almost match Barney. And with where Matt's character goes, he seems really set to grow into those later book Matt extremely well. But yes, he is being uh, held prisoner by Leandrin, who I still can't figure out if is just supposed to be both Elida and Leandrin or just Leandrin yet. We'll, I guess, see in later seasons or later this season. And I think we see Leandrin directly lie to Matt. Although I guess you could attribute that to some Aes Sedai subversion trickery. I'm not Sure, but she says, uh, well, I need more episodes before we talk about this because I don't want to give away too much and that's a dangerous thing to begin just talking about willy-nilly with spoilers in Wheel of Time. But Matt is here and he's digging his way through the wall and he eventually runs into Min who is being kept in the cell adjacent to him. And at first, I was really against this. It felt too convenient, kind of strange, but with what happens in episode three, we'll get to. It actually just feels like I said I ploys and something that worked out quite well. While we're talking about Aes Sedai type things, the Nynaeve witnessing healing and how impactful that clearly is on her, sensational. Uh, it is definitely setting her on the path to join the Aja she's eventually going to join. I don't like this increase of her like possibly going red at all. That just feels wrong and like no one would believe that even for a moment. But I get if especially Leandrin is going to encapsulate an Elida and someone else type character, why you would then use from a writing perspective Nynaeve to keep that character relevant to the narrative overall. Again, doesn't feel like the story of Wheel of Time, but for this show and what they're setting up so far, it does make sense. And one more positive, Elaine and Egwene. The chemistry between these two and these two actresses embodying these characters so far Spot on. I wasn't the biggest fan of Elaine for some reason being able to bring in a bunch of furniture, no one apparently noticing and then getting in trouble for it. But the characterization of her then refusing to give up a name and taking the punishment herself and then Egwene respecting that, that all really worked. And then Elaine calling out Egwene on being jealous later on also yeah, well done. Like, that is Elaine. She is someone who does not put up with, like, too much between Egwene and Nynaeve, and she often, like, when their rivalry gets too heated, becomes, like, a voice of reason. Those character beats are, in my opinion, the most book-accurate thing yet. And just an overall aesthetic, the Elaine actress is pretty much exactly how I pictured Elaine. Great job on casting there. Just a final note here with the Nynaeve Leandrin thing, though. I guess we're just completely doing away with Aes Sedai composure, because we have an Aes Sedai, like, scream-crying and slapping Nynaeve, so that's just gone. And just so I don't sound too overwhelmingly negative, there is something with Lan and Moraine I really enjoy, and that is some references to New Spring, the prequel novel we get, and the chemistry we see there when they're talking about it. Uh, that gave me some warm and fuzzies and being like, ah, these, the writing and some of the setup might be driving me nuts, but these performers, when they are given something that is quality, can realize it. It's quickly undercut by this horrible treatment of Elan and Moraine, in my opinion, overall. But as a fan, I'm still able to find things that I can really latch onto and be like, ah, I got to see this in live action. And it's a reference in a scene that works well and fully pulls me into that world. But ending this episode, though, we get the Sean Chan and they show up and this battle sequence had rough patches, but overall the execution of the arrival in the Shan Chan and the vibe they have, uh, I wish there was like more soldiers, but I don't think that would have worked out well with the size of the hunting party we had. So they, they had to balance it out and it makes sense. Uh, but the Shan Chan arrival had weight, it had momentum. And in episode two, I was kind of questioning if it would pull it off, but once we transitioned into episode three, yeah, the Shan Chan feel like the Shan Chan and they are 
brutal. And Perrin rescuing Loyal worked out for me. And oh, sorry, just pulling back for a moment, we get a whole bunch of different cities, and I want to give credit to set designers and whoever's working on like the VFX for these cityscapes. They are truly recognizing the diversity of cultures that influence various countries within the Wheel of Time, and I can actually immediately figure out what city we're in before I even read the caption because it's just like, that's Karian. I know that's Karian because it's an accurate enough to the book uh, visualization of it that I can just go, boom, right. Oh, yep, that's Karian. Cool. But episode three is my favorite episode overall with my least favorite moment overall as well, which should speak to how high the highs did get for episode three at times. The main focus here for me in terms of my emotional investment was Nynaeve's accepted test because that had a potential to be truly horrific and brutal, and it was in the final leg of it. The first two legs were fine to bad because she goes through the first portal and we get her as a young woman seeing her parents butchered and she's gotta go. I wish it had been given more time to breathe. I wish it had actually been immersed in that longer, but it's over pretty quick. Though, I get why it would be terrifying for Nynaeve. She then goes through into her second portal, which was the weakest by far, uh, and she sees a plague in the two rivers, and the dialogue here didn't really work for me. Even the makeup effects of this disease or fever, whatever they're talking about, didn't look great. Uh, when she stepped out of that one, I was like, okay. And then the third happens, and it actually took me a moment to realize when the, oh, reveal of she's still actually in the test, uh, I thought she really was stepping out and leaving. I bought into that for a moment, and then it wasn't until her uh, interaction with Egwene that I figured out, oh, no, 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 she's still in the arches, and this is still the test. And between this and when Nynaeve actually gets out, there's so much wrong. But when she gets out, there's something wrong there, too. But the performance almost saves it, but we'll get there. First, I want to fill in the rest of what happens in this episode. And yeah, they kill off Uno brutally. And in a way that actually kind of feels true to his character. No way Uno would get down on one knee and bow down to the Shan Chan. It's taking away a character that I love in the books, didn't really love this interpretation of, so it's kind of like a sour, sweet taste where I'm like, okay, this guy didn't feel like Uno to me. But they gave him a good characterization of Uno moment to take him out on, so... Yeah, that's the best outcome I could have seen with this realization of this character I wasn't that big a fan of. And it really added a layer of lethality to the Shan Chan that I am a tremendous fan of. The Shan Chan should not feel weak, and they do not. They feel like this returning invading force inspired by a mixture of like Persia and ancient Greece and how they'll come into play the rest of the season and in later seasons with this showcasing of them being so harsh has my interest peaked. I didn't think this adaptation of Wheel of Time would get that gory. It was that gory. And again, I like Uno's character, but he's also a character where nearly everything he does in later books, I could see another character handling. So it was shocking. It got rid of an interpretation I wasn't the biggest fan of, and it showed me this interpretation of Wheel of Time is willing to go dark. So all right, is how I'm feeling about it. We also get Matt, of course, having his interactions with men and finally let go uh, by Leandrin, and it all turns out it was a big trap by Leandrin to get him sent off with men. And that's why I was like, okay, this kind of works. One way or the other, she was gonna introduce him to men. He managed to figure it out on his own, and so this kind of just leads into her ploy uh, where Matt is just emotionally torn down by her, and then she just kicks him on out to uh, basically try and figure out more Moraine's uh, schemes and plans uh, by having someone she considers her eyes and ears right alongside of him that he would never suspect. And I also want to give credit to Min's actress. She's able to deliver those like dry Min lines of humor uh, pretty much book accurate, spot on. But this takes us to talking about Randall, Thor, and Celine, where again, they're weaving in things from the book where I like get what they're trying to realize. It's just so far removed from how it's presented in the book that you have to do this gargantuan leap and drag it over to be like, all right, that's what this is supposed to be. Because we get introduced to the game of houses and we see Celine and Rand crash a wedding so that Rand can get some wine for Loghain that he asked for, for Loghain to be able to teach him how to channel. And the game of houses, Interesting. I like this like overly opulent party and the nobles just giggling over themselves and Rand's disgust at it. I even enjoy him leaving Celine and there's like this edge under her where she's like, you don't get to do that. But once Rand gets the wine and takes it to Loghain, 
it betrays source material so much, but we now know for sure Mazarum Time and Logan are gonna be two separate characters in this show that I'm, this is just not Logan in terms of his characterization at all. Like Logan in the books is just depressed and really not mad after he's gentled, uh, at least to the extent we're seeing here in the show. But again, the performance from the actor for this let's just call him a new character, is enticing. I like what this guy is. It's just not Logan at all. But he's so mad, Rand essentially realizes you can't help me, pushes him away, and storms off. And if they use the, what's set up here with Rand working with these men and his interactions with Logan to have things in later seasons or even just later this season, I'll have liked it. Though, if this is just a choice that was made and has no real payoff again, I'm going to be quite mad and feel like my time was wasted. So we'll just have to wait and see on this. In the moment, enjoyable. This show just hasn't really built faith for me to believe all of this will be utilized in a way uh, later on for all these changes to feel necessary. But then Rand gets back and he's in his coat from the wedding again after having changed to go see Logan. I need to look at his costume again to see if he like took it off and was still wearing the same pants and maybe just threw it back on. But I was, I definitely was like, why are you out of your fancy clothes back in? Did you take the time to change? <laughs> but he then sleeps with Selene again and uh, there's some twisting of the power and the distortion around what's happening with Rand. I hope we see it continue to increase exponentially, especially with him in the clutches of who he's in the clutches in uh, because the wild moments of channeling here where he lights a building on fire and he seems just so out of control really makes me look forward to Mad Rand because say what you will about the show, Yosef Stradowski really does seem like Rand to me. And final note, I like the choice that we aren't seeing a continual effect around people when they embrace the source, whether it's Aes Sedai or Rand, and instead just seeing the weaves. I was conflicted about that at first, but overall, it it did end up being the right call in my opinion, not only to save on a VFX budget, but I think it would be distracting to see like Super Saiyan energy around them or something kind of dumb like that all the time. Just seeing the weaves works because uh, it's kind of like we, the audience, are not given full access to being the you know, seeing the world out channelers do, but we at least get more than like your layman. So that, that ends up working out. All of this comes together with the Shanshan and Rand and what's happening with Nynaeve to have this show feel dangerous and have some horrific stuff that makes me interested in whatever story this is. At the end of episode one, Kayla turned to me and went, why is any of this happening? But by the end of episode three, she turned to me and went, I'm gonna finish watching this season. It was good enough as a story uh, to work for her. Granted, I went on like a 10 minute rant about all the changes from the book that just did not make sense to me. But after I kind of just, again, let all that go, I did find myself thinking about the implications of this separate story. I know I'm repeating myself, I'll stop that now. But let's talk about finally the biggest misstep for this episode. Now, I like Nynaeve's third trial. I like that she goes and lives this full life and has these emotional attachments and watches them brutally killed before her and then tries to run out from this third test carrying her child. And when she gets through the gateway, that child is gone. Oh my God, the emotional impact of that worked. I hate the fact that apparently they close the gateway and accept that like, okay, Nynaeve is dead. Egwene goes down there and tries to activate it on her own. Elaine shows up and is like, you can't do this. And then the next time we see Elaine and Egwene again, they've both just chosen to take a nap in there. Why? What? What? <laughs> what? What? Was this just so they could see Nynaeve come out? Why was any of those choices made? Because also, in the next episode, we should see all the Aes Sedai having an emergency meeting to be like, holy God, people can come back. Our entire methodology of raising accepted needs to be rethought. This is like earth shattering, breaking big deal. But I know this show is going to just kind of gloss over that or at least not have the big changes that need to be done after the accepted test is shown to not function or have a potential people didn't see like previously, like just why? I mean, Elaine and Egwene being there, just have them still arguing and then Nynaeve fall out, have them still going at it. That would have made more sense than them just being asleep for some reason. But Zoe Robbins' performance as she just shrieks in pain, losing a child that was real to her, someone that we as an audience know she spent so much time with, 
like I, I had to have like a moment of silence. Like it, it hurt. There was the critical part of my brain going off. But again, I, as a viewer, like appreciating this performance, like my heart broke for Zoe Robbins for Eve there. So it was like, oh, I hate those creative choices, but the execution you emotionally tugged on me. And then finally, uh, the sequence with Perrin and one of the Forsaken in a wagon with him was just raising questions and having the wolves come in and Perrin run off with the wolves kind of looked a little goofy. I, I'm just not sure they know how to handle Perrin's powers in terms of showcasing them, especially with how his eyes are being handled in the visions. Though at first the Forsaken saying the more wolf you are, the more you are for me came across wrong. In hindsight, with knowing these are just mind games, or at least I hope they're just mind games being played on Perrin to make him unsettled. Yeah, I'm actually very okay with it. That sets up pretty nicely for me. It's just the visuals around it again. I'm like, this... It's a boy running off with a dog in the woods at a distance. <laughs> Overall though, season two is stronger than season one. I am going to be very critical of this show because this is the most important fantasy series in my life. And having it juxtaposed with One Piece right now, which is so faithful and in many ways, just as large a story as Wheel of Time, it adds a little extra bitter taste in my mouth. If you don't want to see someone be this critical, point out differences, question things, I understand, don't watch, absolutely fine. But I am gonna end this on a positive note. This is above the bar season one set. I think episode one was as bad as season one. I'd give it like a four or three out of 10. Episode two, I'd more comfortably put it a six. And episode three, I would say is sitting between a six to a seven, though closer to a six. At a scale of suburban Sasquatch at a one, and I don't know, the two towers being a perfect 10, Wheel of Time season two is sitting at a light six out of 10 for me so far. Uh, I hope as they get further from the mistakes that were made in season one and dedicate the show to trying to correct course, that could continue to rise. Or if screw it, they just try to totally embrace being their own thing, that version of the story becomes interesting in its own right. I just know if they try and fence sit between the two, it'll fail for sure. But let me know your thoughts on the first three episodes in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Keep an eye out for all the people telling me I'm wrong for various reasons. And I will be back with a, uh, a Court of Thorns and Roses tipsy review on the fifth. I read the first and last chapter. I'm trying to fill out everything in between while drinking with Kayla. It's a total blast and uh, I cannot wait to get that video out for y'all. My book, Neon Ghosts, is available now. And have a good one, y'all. Bye. Bye.